And first of all, reception of guests. Matthew, thanks for coming again. Anything in particular you want to have a list about tonight? Not really. I can talk about goals when you get there if you want. Okay. Good. Thanks. Matthew, are you a Berlin parent? Or no. I've seen you before. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm I'm on the Worcester School Board and, oh. and uh, on the S E School Board chair this year. So just visiting a lot of meetings. Great. Cindy, welcome. Cindy Gothier, third and fourth grade teacher. Sorry, I was late, Cindy. Okay. Um, we'll take a look at the agenda. And does anyone have any comments or revisions to the agenda? Any public comments or correspondence to the board? Um, I'm not sure if this is the right time. It should be brought up during the resignation. I'm assuming. Uh, I guess now is the right time. Just somebody had reached out to me about doing whatever it takes to keep it shut while still here at school. So can we um, maybe discuss that under yep, just just resignation? Making a comment. Yeah, I had to actually say the same comment from a few people. I was also wondering, speaking of resignation, I noticed a paraeducator position posted over at the town office, but I didn't see anything about somebody resigning, so I was wondering if it's an additional or if there's another resignation we haven't seen yet. It's an additional paraeducator that is um, that we have in the budget for next year. Uh, we had done some, we did a deep analysis, Carol, I don't think there's a, is there a replacement of somebody? I don't think so. Nancy and the Levy. Yeah, okay, Nancy, yeah. And then there was um, the, uh, Ms. Clifton. Yeah, her half-time part as a paraeducator. So, yeah. And I'll just note that I received an email from Jeremy Hansen regarding the telecommunications district meetings. Um, I didn't realize he hadn't approached the school yet, so I'm gonna direct him to to Bill and to Carol uh, to talk about facility use for the telecommunications district meetings. Um, let's see, any other public comments or correspondence? We'll just note under 1.4 that our uh, we have a future meeting on June 6th, and that's a supervisory union board meeting and a carousel meeting. Item 2.1, uh, to approve the minutes of April 9th and May 1st. And those start on page two. Does anyone have any comments about the minutes? In, in 1.3, where I said something, it was, it, I think it should read, C strives for passed along appreciation from Mike for the successful, <coughs> that's, what I thought I remembered saying. Okay. And then with uh, 3.7 under the student artwork, um, to have it clarified where it says prohibited from posting slash circulation, shouldn't that be specifically by board members due to FERPA? Uh, you're on line three of 3.7, Corinne? Yep. <clears throat> Does that apply just to board members, Bill? Or staff. In that Staffing as well as receiving a memo, you have to have permission. Okay. Did yeah. that change? Uh, I'd love to get the wording again. Prohibit from posting circu posting circulation from board members and staff because board members are considered staff under statute. And can you give me it's one point three again? Enough. I couldn't quite understand all of it. Sorry. One point three C Stridesburg passed along appreciation from Mike for the. Thank you. Thank you. 
right. Any other changes to the um, April 9th minutes? Any comments or changes on the March 1st special school board meeting? If none, I'd entertain a motion to approve those minutes with the two changes um, by Corinne. I'll make a motion. And is there a second? I'll second. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 The minutes are approved. And next we have our discussion agenda. Um, we have, uh, Cindy, we have you at item 3.2. Maybe we'll move that ahead of 3.1 if no one objects. No. And we'll kick it off with you. Sure. Yeah. Sure, Cindy. Well, I just wanted to come and have a conversation with you um, about my retirement and just to express deep appreciation for all the opportunities that I've had here. Um, it's more than a job, and more than a job for me, as you, I think you probably know. And there are some things as I'm leaving that I just am hoping that you will hold dear to your hearts, like I have. Um, and some of them are financial things, and some are just, um, just things that I hope somebody will pay attention to, especially with Carol leaving and several other people leaving. Um, I just just some things, in, mostly in the letter, which you already read, but I just thought if I, I spoke to it a little bit, it might um, help you think a little bit more about it. I did want to mention, um, you know, as I went through the letter and things I wanted to say, how much I just appreciate the teachers that my own daughters had when they were here and at U32. And the, some of the people that really stuck out for me was Ellen Cook, Randy Brown, Caroline Grace, um, Julie Seussman and Jane Boucher, and those people had significant um, impact on their lives and the people they've become. I wanted to tell you how much I appreciate you continued support of dental and, and health insurance, and I know that's really hard because it's so expensive, but it just makes such a big difference to know that you have a job that supplies those things. Um, I was kind of surprised to find out that in leaving you get $10 for every day that you haven't used. I mean, I know it's in the contract, but then just seeing it there, I thought, hmm, that's odd. And, um, you know, I've always had a lot of sick days. I haven't, I've luckily not been sick, so I'm able to, you know, have that maximum benefit. But I think about other people that maybe, um, you know, have used up their days a little bit more quickly um, and just... I'm glad that we can share those days if we have extras and people need them, so I hope that will continue. Um, I appreciate the professional development opportunities that you continue to support and keeping those things in the budget. And, um, and I know there's negotiated issues, but I really feel like it makes a big difference when people can go and take classes and learn the things that you want to learn. And I mean, I've been so fortunate that you've heard, I earned two master's degrees from working here that I paid very little personal money for because it was part of my professional development money. And I hope that you'll continue with that. Um, it's just been such a blessing for me to have seen, you know, kids over the years. And then I talked about in the letter having like two generations of being able to teach two generations is just so, um, rewarding to see that and then to know that you had maybe a little piece in who these uh, adults have become and then their children are becoming. Um, I wanted to mention Kim Farone because she's an amazing teacher and I don't think people really always realize how good she is. She works very, very hard. She is here early in the morning. She is willing to meet with teachers. She meets with kids before school. She meets with kids during her lunch period. I don't know if she eats a lunch at all, but she's very dedicated. And I don't think that people um, always recognize that as much as I do. And also, having worked with her on the time, I don't know if you remember or you were on the board at that time, but she was riffed and then I took her place and she was so kind with that transition and just helped me understand that job and where somebody else might not have been. So I really appreciate that in her. Um, I really appreciate the Washington Central staff and all the support that they give. 
and um, people like like Bill, Carol Freeman, who's no longer there, but she was, I really enjoyed working with her, Jen and Ellen Dorsey. Ellen is just a godsend to math, so I hope if there's any way that we can keep her and keep that work going, I think it's really been important. Um, I've worked at the summer school and I love working with Kelly and Allison Fail and Robin Gannon and Kara and I just feel like those summer opportunities are super, super important. I wish we could find a way to broaden that out for other kids that don't have IEPs, um, similar to what we did that one summer with the Math Monday where we had opened that up to anybody that was interested and they could come and we worked in the garden and we did math and it just kept them going a little bit more, I think. So I don't know if there's any opportunity for that, but I would encourage you to continue that if you can. Of course, the farm to school stuff, you know from that recent presentation how important that is to me. Um, we had a nice tree planting on Friday. We collaborated with the Central Mont Rotary and the Central Mont Career Center. Uh, I had a conversation with Carol and Earl at Barry Opera House at an event and it sort of sparked it off and Carolyn talked to the Rotary and they were planting the trees around Central Vermont. So I said, I got a place, perfect place for you. So now we have 21 apple trees out there. And um, so hopefully people will care for those and be sure they're maintained. I think Dave Wilcox is definitely um, going to help with, you know, being sure that they're cared for properly with the pruning and all of that. Um, some other, you know, kind of little things, but um, the Bobcat Trail that we worked so hard to fix that path up and, you know, replace the bridges and the boardwalks and it gets people down and using that wetland and the hardwood forest and just seeing those different habitats. So I hope that that will be continued to be maintained. Um, of course, field trips um, to try to close that equity gap. You know, we do have children in Berlin that don't have a lot of the resources that some of the rest of the people have and if they can have those field trips and you know get to places like Boston or Montreal or um, you know the Shelburne Museum or Fort Ticonderoga those kind of trips that we would take our families to but some of these other kids will never get there if we don't take them so I hope that we will continue to do that or you will continue to do that um, I hope that the responsive classroom will continue to be a central focus with uh, teaching people how to care about each other. And I know we have PBIS and we have some other things, but I really feel like that, um, that grounding that in responsive classroom is still important. And um, along with the farm to school, you know, just continuing to keep this garden going, maybe somehow, I don't know if it's possible, thinking about it more of health and wellness. And you know, we have an athletic director, but maybe there's a way that that could be rolled into, um, you know, like a health and wellness coach or something where instead of just athletics, it's about health. And we know that the exercise through the athletics, but also, you know, eating healthy and um, helping with like things like the Junior Iron Chef team, those, that's not a big financial um, responsibility for you all, but finding someone to do the paperwork and um, work with a coach and just to be here when the end of the day, it really needs to be somebody that's at school. The other, another thing is um, our robotics. I hope that you will continue to push that forward. And as far as, I think Berlin's the only one using still the old technology, so it'd be great if somehow their, um, their robots could be updated and they could have the newer technology. And um, another thing that we've lost is the foreign language. So I don't know if there's any way to bring that world cultures back in. I know way back when Carol and Grace's son Nicholas was in kindergarten, um, we had the, the French five students come and we did you know, what we could do one, one time a week with them. And then we ended up bringing the French and the Spanish five students and then um, then when foreign language came, that kind of ended, but then foreign language ended, and so now we don't have anything, and I feel like, you know, it kind of puts our Berlin kids at um, a disadvantage to the rest of the district. So hopefully you'll find a way to bring that back. Um, and then I was thinking about how Jen just asked us to think about what makes a master teacher, and 
and I do really appreciate the Danielson model and all of that that pulls in, but I almost feel like, um, you know, this love of children and then that strong work ethic, which I don't, I don't know how you do, you, you can't really dictate when people are here beyond the contract hours, but just some way to encourage um, embracing the community, not just, not just having this be a job. So, I don't know, that's all I have. <laughs> But I, I thought maybe if I just like you have. spoke to it, that I might be able to encourage you to carry those things forward. Thank you. You're welcome. You have the letter. It's all in oh, this. Cindy, could yeah. you make me a copy of the second page? I didn't notice until I oh. saw you referring yeah. to it that I only had two pages. Yep. So, Cindy, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Because I am one of the ones that have yeah. for as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And my kids have I didn't realize until you were going through your list how many things I've been connected with, whether it's the apple trees, and Craig and I bought a few for my grandmother's remembrance, the garden, the farm to table, the nature trail, mm -hmm. um, the booster clubs, the summer mm -hmm. bath program. <laughs> I, I've been very much a part of a lot of those programs with Cindy, and I'm going to miss working with you on those things. But thank you for You're everything welcome. you've done. You're welcome. Yeah, I'll be around. I'm sure I will, you know, I'll have some time in the garden, or maybe I'll sub, I'll see. Or maybe I'll teach in Thailand. I've had a job offer. <laughs> Ooh, and then, and then many, many things that I remember wonderfully is planting hope, which you were instrumental in. Mm -hmm. yep. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. You have enormous outreach. You're welcome. I hit my 20 year milestone at work, and I was trying to think of just what if. Done right. What's what have I done over my career? And I can't, it can't, you can't compare to what a teacher has done and mm -hmm. the lives that a teacher touches and such a legacy that you have in this school and outside the school of all the people who pass through your classroom. I'm just sad my that Calvin doesn't mm -hmm. get to have you as a teacher, but I'm very lucky with Lauren. So thank you, thank you're you so welcome. much. You're welcome. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah, you're welcome. Really Thanks for listening. Hope I didn't no. overstep my bounds. No, no, no. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Right. So we skipped over to 3.2. Go back to 3.1, the winter SLO monitoring report. So um, this is the outline that we're giving is um, going to be given some more outline to all of the um, boards in the district. Um, I know in the past we've talked about it's very hard to give you a full picture because what we're doing is the spring um, mon uh, monitoring. We're missing out on the end of the year assessments to see even further growth. The agenda is to understand the MT assess the students. What does our student data um, tell current state? What has worked well? What do we need to investigate further? And what supports do we need from the board? So multi-tier support system. Um, it is very well researched here in Vermont. I did bring along one copy because it's pretty dense, but if you would like to borrow it and take a look at it and read it, uh, you can find it online. So if you would want to take a minute and look, we're going to emphasize, it emphasizes the importance of effective, uh, culturally responsive, differentiated first teaching, which you might hear as tier one teaching. That's the teaching that occurs in the classroom. Effective early intervention supports for both academics and behavior for all students. And that's something that we're really looking at here at Berlin. Um, there are several components to the Vermont, which is the one that I'm showing here, which is the MTSSRTII, which is um, response to intervention and instruction as well. So you might want to take a look at the whole document. If you go to the AOE, you can look at that. So we're going to be talking about those different components in the next 
So our fall reading data, this is based on our um, scores in the younger grades. Um, in fall, kindergarten does not do assessments. Uh, first, second, and third do what we call Fontes and Pinnell, or F and P. And um, the uh, older grades do the DRA2, which also goes up into U32. So, um, sorry. So, what we have here is a look at our fall data compared to the winter data. One thing um, that I do have to note, the level four is the highest level. That is a level that is uh, advanced past proficiency. But um, because of the way it is reported in um, IC, and I'm not sure other schools have, uh, there's one other school that has those scores in it, and I'm not sure how they did it. We, it doesn't go, it only goes to level three. Yeah. yeah, so it, it, it's not going to give you that uh, higher score. As you can see, we've had uh, gains. Of course, this is fall to winter. A lot of learning goes on after the winter break into the spring. So what, I'm, what will be happening and what we're doing uh, coming up, we'll hopefully be able to really scrutinize those scores further, see how we're doing what we need to move forward on. And Carol, can you just remind us when the fall assessments and winter assessments are given, just so folks have it? Uh, fall assessments are given in September, uh, right when the children come. Winter is in January, and the, the spring ones are coming up. Um, we have a couple of assessments, above and beyond the DRA2, uh, but, and uh, the FMP, but those are the ones that are reflected in here. The other one is more of a screening diagnostic. Thing. So here's the uh, cross, uh, Bill Kimball put this together, and it's looking at schools across the district. So I don't know, um, you can look at the scores, you can pull up um, is, ours, is yeah, number is two, column ours is column two. So as you can see, we're pretty, uh, in line with the with the rest of the district. Um, doing well. Our math data is based on the STAR 360. Math data is, um, the STAR 360 is more of a screening tool. Uh, what it does is it gives, it's diagnostic, it gives the teachers some ideas of what students need assistance in. So again, if you look at the difference between the fall and winter math data, we are making gains. And this is a real positive, because in the past, we really were not making gains, and sometimes we were making deficits. We had deficits in that area. Um, I'll talk about that when we get further to successes. So across all schools, again, if you look, we are two. Um, and we are pretty in line with the rest of the district, which again, was not the case for our math. Our math is growing, it's getting stronger, and um, that's a real positive. Um, the, again, you've seen this before, it's our multi-year PBIS data, um, and um, I think I've given this previous, this is just updated, uh, but our data for our um, ODRs, what we call office referral forms, is, um, is uh, again, showing progress in that area. Strong PBIS and responsive classroom working together. So successes, the trends overall are good and positive growth in all areas in literacy, math, and behavioral. Um, math scores are comparable <coughs> to the district average and we continue to make gains. And the reason why I focus particularly on that is that wasn't the case. And um, I believe it was the year previous to my coming 
there was a real shift in what we were looking for, maybe two years before I can uh, shift in our math. We started looking at working um, on um, digging deeper into <coughs> concepts and um, having children understand and be able to uh, explain why different math concepts were happening. There, because of this shift, um, the shift, some of the teachers were still learning what they were doing. Um, there was a hard alignment. Uh, people were having a hard time getting that done through the hard work on, uh, of Bill, um, getting a, ma a math coach in place for us, a lot of training, uh, a lot of summer help. The um, teachers have been working very, very hard on the math, and we continue to grow. Kim Perone has been doing an enormous job helping individuals move in that direction. And so we're starting to see students that are coming along that have really strong um, understanding of math concepts, of where a very strong platform to build on. So they are <laughs> not just the children who can memorize that can gain, that can remember um, the rules. Now they understand concepts behind those rules, why those rules apply, and when they can apply those rules. So that's really a wonderful thing. In literacy, we're working far more on um, getting the students to comprehend what they're reading, to truly dig deep, and to um, look at the what it is that they are gaining from the, the content. Um, again, we have the interventionists working, but the tier one or the classroom instruction is really strengthening as well. And that's what the MTSS is, is wanting to do. That is where the true learning should happen in that first classroom setting. And um, all of it works together. We have the uh, behaviors in the classroom. There have been some behaviors outside of the classroom that we're working on, but in the classroom, they can focus on the learning. Um, and it has shown very positively. The last bullet that I put in is not in the presentation, but is something that I felt should be focused on, is uh, what our, um, our um, language, uh, Meg Dawkins works with students quite a lot. And we don't really see, she's like a behind the scenes kind of person. And we think, oh, she just works with one or two people. But in fact, she's been working very hard with the kindergartners to help to strengthen their phonological awareness, which is the building blocks for reading and understanding. Um, she uses visual phonics, which is incredible if you ever get an opportunity to go in and watch her, and that she has trained the kindergarten and first grade teachers. So when you have a child who is learning a sound and they're having a hard time hearing or saying the sound, there is an actual visual that goes along with it. It's uh, an adaptation of sign language. And I have uh, in my walkthrough observations or just in the classroom working with students, seen where um, a child in a kindergarten level, even first grade level, is struggling with a sound and the teacher makes the signal and the child, it just, the child just gets it. So that is only going to help our reading scores even farther when you have only 24% of the kindergarten students meeting the standard in the beginning of such a key concept. And at the, at the spring level, this was a spring level, 96%, only one student did not reach the level. So again, Meg is not someone that we hear frequently about, um, but her work is very, very important to the school. Um, possible improvements, um, we need to, uh, strengthen professional learning communities and enrich team discussion and improve data driven decision making and practices. We really need to continue to look at the data and determine how we can best meet and change our instruction at the level uh, one, tier one level. Um, we do that frequently. That's why uh, teachers 
prefer to have uh, teams that they can work with and um, meet together to look at the data with the interventionists to determine next steps. Analyze efficiency and intervention um, model in literacy and mathematics. My suggestion and what I am doing, Erin is coming to um, the school early in June. That's the new principal. Um, I have set up a schedule. He is going to meet. I have told the uh, interventionist to present to him what we're doing. Um, my strong suggestions would be, and they're aware of it, we have now a good two to three day, years of data. We need to, and we were starting it this year, but it needs to continue to dig deep, deep and to look at um, retention of what the students are doing when they are intervention, if they are doing uh, working on a specific concept and they go back to the classroom, I want to see assessments done three, four months out and then continue to make sure that they're retaining that um, information that they're getting at that tier two level, that it's being maintained at the tier one level. If not, we need to look at, is it the presentation at the tier two level so that it is not, do they need more time and practice? Is it something that's lacking in the tier one level or the classroom level so that the children are not having enough chance or there's not enough connect between the interventionists and the teachers to allow the children to continue to practice that work? Do you understand what I mean? So uh, create a schedule that enha enhances the uh, effectiveness of interventions, and we are working on that. But the schedule also will allow that team time for uh, individuals to work together, to plan together, especially when you have multi-grade and people working in teams. Uh, continue to support learning about the implementation response to trauma-informed classroom. Uh, that is ongoing. That's ongoing district-wide. Um, it's something that Bill has supported greatly um, and the other schools have as well. I think Berlin is a little ahead of the curve uh, for many of the students in the district, but it is a way that we need to keep going. Identify, and this is something that was in our continuous improvement plan before, and I feel it is still so important, so do the teachers. Identify strategies students need to build stamina and determine how these strategies will be taught. Um, some students um, cannot stay at a task for very long. It's um, sometimes hard because if you look at some of the things that some of the students do in their spare time, it's uh, a lot of un, you know instant gratification with video games and things like that. So we need, just need children to be able to stay on task. Uh, the genius hour is one of those, uh, building those transferable skills, looking at those, those kinds of things. Um, build a school-wide culture in which ethnic, uh, uh, the ethic of presenting best work is the norm. So um, I've talked about I love the genius hour, but I would love to see a more polished piece of work at the end of that time, having students take more pride in what they're presenting and how they're presenting their knowledge. And then advanced tier three PBIS supports. We are a tier three school, which means that we do need to look at the data to determine children that have higher needs that can be um, met at the tier one level or the tier two level. Tier one is the classroom level and continue those supports. Tier two examples of those are um, Lucia and the work that she does, which is phenomenal with students. Um, to help them, but sometimes we need a little bit more support in that area. Uh, board support, keep on supporting the math and literacy intervention positions. We've had this on before, and it is moving, but support a change in the school start and dismissal time. Um, support the work in moving forward and meeting the goals set out in the student learning uh, outcomes and transferable skills. That work that this district is doing is phenomenal and I highly suggest that you know you really dig deep when you're looking at your own board goals to see make sure that you have a clear understanding and 
we have been doing some work with the transferable skills, and um, we'll be I'll doing a presentation at my last board meeting because this one's a little long about a team that has went to a training last week and uh, the work that that we're starting towards building habits of mind and those transferable skills here at the school and continue to work to educate the community. Uh, public education is our responsibility to meet the needs of all students that we care about. So that is what I ask. I guess Cindy had her request. <laughs> and if you think of that as you know my request, and I know this is this is a phenomenal school and there is growth in all areas and you should be proud of the support that you've been doing with the schools and in helping us continue to move forward. And I think you're going to keep on seeing that growth and those scores can, can keep on going up and we're at par with the rest of the district and I think we could surpass. Thank you, Carol. Does anyone have any questions about the, uh, the update and monitoring report? I did. Um, I'm wondering how much movement we see with kids moving in and out of our school in grades one, two, and three. I, I seem to recall that over the years, for every time you get excited about seeing two or three students move in, that some are moving out. And I'm just wondering if there's much of that going on right now and how that affects the, the testing, like if their test scores oh, would I come see what with you're them. Saying. Yeah, no, I haven't seen a lot of movement in and out this year as we have. There is some, but not as much as we have seen in the past. And you're right, there would be, um, like, we would start school and then there'd be a shift. And um, it, not that it hasn't happened. But it really hasn't happened a lot this year, so I hadn't even thought about that. But and so do their test scores come with them if they've tested elsewhere? Well, these test scores are what we do district in our district. So if we have a child who moves into district that has done F and P mm -hmm. and Fontes and Pinnell, mm -hmm. then they would move with them, but um, in, and they would be there, but they wouldn't necessarily be in our system. We keep our um, information in what we call infinite campus. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Which has been a, a wonderful addition. Again, something that Bill has worked very hard to get into place, um, knowing that the way of, you know, to look at the data, we need to have it all centralized in one place with um, teachers having easy access to it. So okay. that would not be in there to compare it necessarily. I was also wondering is how they do on the tests in the fall, is that what helps decide what extra help they're getting going forward for the rest of the year or is that based on other well, the, the screener, the, the STAR 360 is a good screener, and that does help, yes, and that is very important. Um, we use that, what it has in the fall, but there is constantly, um, if a child does get intervention, the interventionists are doing running records and reading. Um, Kim is keeping her own uh, formative assessment, which could be, uh, looking at how the children are doing on-demand tasks as they leave her room, things like that. So those always influence. It's best to use many different sources of uh, information to, to look at um, what children's needs are, but um, these, are, these are areas, that, the F&P and the DRA2 and the STAR 360 are areas that we use a lot in the beginning. And my only other question is, maybe I'm just missing it, but you seem to have two boxes of board supports, and I only have one in my thing here, but I was pretty sure you flipped to a second page of them up there. No, I, th I, I think I only have one. So there's just four bullet points under board supports? I thought you went over more than four items. It might have seemed like I was giving more than I did, <laughs> but I don't... Well, I didn't take notes because I had this, and then it didn't seem to... Maybe because sure. the uh, the format's the same, but she had the she had the three slides that you see there at the end. I yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm not missing something. How about you, girl? Yes. 
So when the students are taking um, either the STAR 360 for math or either one of the literacy, depending on the grades, are they taking it at the grade level standards or are they taking it where they're at? They're to be taking it at the grade level standards. Yes, and that was something that Jen Miller and the uh, curriculum um, individual on the curriculum committee had talked about. It's very important to make sure that we have this data to be able to compare across districts and to make sure that our we, we can see the way our students. Um, but yes, they are taking it at their level. I'm curious, Carol and Bill, when you look at these numbers, and it's great to see some improvements some trends in the in a good direction how do you apply it to what's happening in the school do you use it to inform you know, more focus on a particular area or more support for a certain area mm -hmm. and again I think that it's really important to look at this and to dig a little deeper so that if um, we're seeing that um, say in an area of math there is a pocket of students that are having problems so then we might look back at the instruction and that's one of the problems that we've had in the math is that two well three three years ago or when I started there was such an influx and it was hard to look back first of all we didn't have the data and um, second it was it was kind of a little bit in turmoil because people were teaching math, but the alignment wasn't uh, as strong as it is now because of the enormous amount of work that um, Ellen has done, Jen Miller has done, Bill has done to help to make sure that we pulled uh, that math, aligned it, and created a very strong curriculum. And we're starting to see the fruits of those work now with these scores that we're getting. and, and uh, I don't know if that really answered your question. What you need to do is just dig deep and see, okay, is this a problem that we're missing something in the classroom that isn't being done? Or is it just, you know, these students, certain students are just not getting it, and if they just get that little bit of oomph from Kim, they get their regular, but they get a little bit to feather out those misconceptions that they have in that area, then they'll fly. So that's, again, what I was saying. I, I specifically set up time, talked to Bill extensively about this as well, uh, with Aaron, with the interventionist, and making my suggestions, and they're aware of um, what their needs are, is to now look and see, are these interventions being successful? And if a child is going out of their intervention group as being proficient, do they continue to hold on to that? If not, then where is the problem? Is it at the tier one level or the two or a combination? But it has to be addressed. If it's not addressed, then those students won't continue to grow. Mm -hmm. So that, that's going to be something that we're going to have a, a, a pretty hearty discussion with Aaron and um, further, I'm sure. And he, I'm sure, will be um, very supportive. He seems like a, Kind of gentleman that would really want to move that forward as well. Are there ways that you're trying to ensure some consistency so we keep that momentum going? There's a, there's a lot of transition in the schools mm -hmm. over the next year. I, I imagine the curriculum alignment helps so that everybody's kind of tracking this, mm -hmm. the same way, but with a lot of new teachers and a, and a new principal, there are particular things that you're doing to try to keep that momentum going? Well, one of the things that, uh, again, Bill and I had talked about early on uh, was when we had the um, great ability to um, find and, and recruit someone within district who already knows some of the, the, the um, initiatives that we're working forward on and has, uh, from my understanding, um, and I... <coughs> heard great things and seen things when we went for the interview to observe um, that we'll keep that work going in a wonderful way. Um, there are strong mentorships that um, Bill has put in place in this district that I have not seen in other districts that I think is a phenomenal way to help people um, stay. 
informed. There are summer offerings. We're having uh, Mahesh uh, Sharam, who is one of the uh, individuals who is uh, focused in our math work, is, um, is, is very involved, and we're advertising with our new individuals to do that. There's responsive classroom uh, work going on over the summer, so there are a lot of things in place to help those individuals move forward. Uh, again, the mentoring program, I think, is huge. And to have uh, that in place and the support from Bill and Jen Miller Arsenault in that is, is I think, a, a real plus as well. Thanks, Carol. Any other questions on the report? Thank you. Item 3.3 is board goals. And those are on um, page 6 of your packet. You can see. Um, some uh, goals that were put together by the executive committee. Matthew, do you want to speak to this at all? Or just... uh, I don't have them in front of me. <laughs> but uh, the, yeah, these are, I think everyone will remember that these goals were the topics anywhere were prioritized by the uh, SU board at its meeting in late March. And the executive committee was more or less charged with trying to flesh these out, and uh, so we discussed our, our meeting at the end of April, and this reflects kind of, you know, the material that we put together and all the input and the comments from that meeting. Um, so uh, again, just to repeat, you know, our, personally, my hope or aspiration would be that boards, the SU boards, the district boards of the SU, I should say, would, would adopt these goals in common. Um, even if there are other goals that you may feel are specific to, to Berlin Elementary. Um, but obviously that's at your discretion. So. And just to refresh everybody's memories, we've, we've had in our packet almost every month, we've had our Berlin board goals, which were kind of four or five different categories. Um, and Matthew came and, and spoke to us and, and asked us to kind of wait and see what the executive committee would come up with before we adopted any new board goals. And personally, I think the three big categories we have here encompass just about everything that we had in, in our um, board goals. Um, ours were very specific and didn't necessarily attach well to an activity or a timeline. Um, so there was some discussion about maybe doing them in a different format, perhaps starting from scratch. But now we have in front of us what the executive committee has come up with in the, the three large categories that I think the larger SU board had um, three were, were pretty important. Um, so I guess open to suggestion about how we proceed from here with board goals with, uh, with these three in front of us and knowing what we had had in our specific goals before that. Concerns about maybe these being too compressed or too narrow, or not addressing the Berlin specific topics that we had come up with. Well, number one, I'm fine with um, in goal two. I guess I would rather see it a little more specific to the norm. Um, I think if our governance is to be setting goals and achieving them, it's hard to, for me, um, to just assume that something's there within what's here, but it's really not. And if we're asking the administration and the staff for very specific things that I feel are truly important, but again, that's my opinion. Um, 
I think you could add on to this a little bit, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure probably the four members. And goal three, I think, again, is pretty. Um, I like it, but again, I would want to tweak the activities on the timeline for what's to go for. Current, do those three categories cover what you'd like to see in board goals, or is there something that would fit outside of those those three goals, larger goals? Um, I was just going back and comparing to mm -hmm. what we had been talking about. Um, I really think a lot of the other board goals kind of fit in these things. Mm -hmm. That's what I definitely. I tend to agree with Vera as far as I think a lot of stuff could be part of this, but we wouldn't necessarily uh, we wouldn't necessarily be running it as far as the specific activities timeline that I see here. Um, and I got to say, I'm I'm still at the point where I'd like to see something more specific as far as board policies. That, that's mm -hmm. not going to go away until it's happened, in my mind. What are your feelings, Chris? Ms. Brooks? I, I think I'd like to, I mean, I, the, the broad categories are, are great. I think mm -hmm. those encompass just, just about everything that I'd like to work on as a, as a board goal. It's a question of how we um, feed into those. These are much much broader for, for the district. Um, I, I do think there's some more specificity around Berlin Elementary that I'd like to, to see. And I don't know if we can you know, kind of take the broader goal and then underneath it put in some Berlin-specific issues we'd like to, to point out or address or, or, or guide. <clears throat> the administration with. I think that's what I struggle with too. Is so many documents become a living document, like what you're going to do for that year. Yeah. And I get like WCSU as a whole; these, these are great. Um, and then you take the individualized communities and the schools, and then you have six more documents to read from. So not everybody being on the same page is difficult too. So I struggle within myself of. Do you take broad and work from that and hope that you're working together as a team to achieve the, the more um, individualized pieces? Or so maybe, do we change the document well, and have that many? Yeah. We do have differences at the school. So there's oh, yeah. no way to there's no, get around yeah, that. I totally understand that. And I struggle within myself to find the right answer and how. But I would say it should be a really much different approach in most schools to most issues on board governance or board yeah. monitoring or even community engagement. And, and maybe what we're struggling with is... Can I re reflect on something that sure. I heard at the executive committee? Yeah, go ahead. On goal three with community engagement, it quickly became apparent that with six board members around the table, there's probably four different definitions of what community engagement is mm -hmm. and who does it and how mm -hmm. it's done. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, even who does it and how it's done probably quickly became right. everybody, a different one for everyone that was around the table, including myself. So I think that those are good conversations to have. I think for tonight, also I would add to that, I think tonight you should talk about what you think those idiosyncrasies are because in the end of May on the 30th, board chairs, have been invited to attend if the executive committee member is not um, the board chair. Chris mm -hmm. happens to do that. Chris McVay is that as well. The rest are separate. Um, and so um, there's going to be more of a discussion about, I think this is going to be the exact discussion. So I think having that information to represent Berlin at that meeting will be very uh, crucial in trying to bring something for the 6th of June forward. Like for an example, for something that I have, in that 
it's very specific. And again, it's probably so specific, but one of the goals is, you know, how can the board support the growth within Genius Hour and students are empowered to explore their own passions and interests and a focus on science and world studies, which sometimes that kind of gets put on the back table because math and literacy take priority. So, um, but it's so super specific that I don't know. And that's just one of like some that I've gone through and written down. So Bill, how does that one fit in in your mind? This is a very, this is so not box, governance, box. it's not monitoring of student learning. It's to me, it would be in the monitoring student learning. How it's worded might not seem if that, okay. to me, that's where it would fall is the monitoring. But it's very specific to also grades because it's only yeah. four. So for six. me, that's a, that's a means to an outcome. So that's a way to get to personalization for students. Which is, uh, so I mean, I think about that's a that's a bigger that's a that's a solution. That's a way to find that. And so I think this goes right to board governance. And what's the role of the board in establishing goals? And there are some pieces that board should have. They should have some say in the inputs, and they should have say in where they want the outputs to be. And so I think that that's one that you need to talk about as a board: is where's our role in the governance of the system. And how far are we into ensuring that to happen? And I said I'd be a total fan of Genius Hour, but uh, I think we need personalization for all students all the way from pre-K through graduation. Mm -hmm. And we need to, that's, uh, it's one thing Carol's worked hard with the team to really bring about in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grades. So does a specific goal like that help you, or you would rather see something more broad that, that talks about personalization of education? I'd rather see something more broad because that allows the ownership of that creative idea to come from the teachers. So to piggyback off on that, the next one is maintain and deepen opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning and flexible pathways. Think of that right there. That, that just encapsulated what you said before. Mm -hmm. Which is what I have right below. <laughs> and so this is another example of um, I have students are meeting grade level expectations at the end of each grade, K through six, report out three times a year to match the local assessment schedule. But I think on here, I don't know am I reading it, but it's twice. It's twice right now. Is there any, and then this is a question, yep. just asking, is there any way that we can get this spring assessments before the start of the next school year? Because so really right now we kind of miss out on the spring assessments. Right, so um, it would mean a September and an October presentation, and so we try to do it once together so we can bring everything together. It's the speed in which we're um, able to report those back right now, Infinite Campus is getting, we're getting the procedures. It's literally the human procedures, not the computer procedures, to get all that data turned around and get it back out. We had the data as a system in the beginning of April. And what we're trying to do, and this, as you saw tonight from Carol's, this is a template that we all agreed to on the leadership team, we're gonna use the same template. And then just plug in the data. Our hope is that we're gonna have Infinite Campus is going to get better and better, and it is with the work that Michelle Sutka is leading us through as the data manager at the central office to create literal dashboards within the, um, within the application. The reason we can't turn it on today for you to see it is because there would be student names with student data on there, and we're in a public setting. The hope is that eventually we'll have reports embedded in there, so we don't even make the PowerPoints anymore. It's just we'll show you the data. It looks good that we're going to be there for the beginning of the school year. I just can't promise that 110 percent. And so that gets to Vera's place of we should be able to instantaneously, you know, once the teachers are working on the results, we should be able to give you these high level because what they do is they're going to take and okay, now we need the names there. We need the other information that we had that Carol was talking about that the teachers using those team names to drill down and understand what's what are the drivers. I think we can get there, Vera. I, I 
just don't know exactly today. I know we're, every day we're closer and closer. Matthew, did you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, with your, I, I guess, just to try to talk about um, <coughs> why uh, the goals are kind of phrased this way and why they land when they land it. Um, so I, I think you all know that I've been going to a lot of these, a lot of board meetings. Um, and, you know, before I did that, I really thought it was going to be a drag. Um, and it was just going to be a, a grind, I guess, is a way of saying it, right? It took a lot of time and sitting through meetings. And, um, but to my surprise, it's actually been uh, incredibly valuable. Um, and the, the way that I kind of describe it is, um, you know, the parable of the blind man and, and the elephant, right? Like one's got his hand on the leg and thinks it's that some kind of certain kind of animal, and one thinks it's a snake because he's got the trunk, and one thinks it's a piece of paper because he's got the ear. And nobody had really seen it going on. I feel like really for the first time in many years of board service, I'm actually starting to get a glimpse of the whole animal a little bit. Um, these goals are, are actually broader than I, as an administrator myself, would prefer to see them and as a board member. Um, but I think, and, and they really kind of take the nature of commitments on the part of the boards to have conversations, really like the one you're talking about here. Because I don't think that we address the issues of monitoring student learning and how we want to operate as boards and how we engage our communities. I don't think we have those conversations as a group. We have we have six different conversations. Um, and it's increasingly apparent to me that that is just baked into the way we operate um, and have operated for a long time. So these goals are really more commitments to have those conversations as a group and to try to figure out and get the, the input of the administration is crucial, I think, is what Bill's saying, is how we operationalize you know, some of these things. We, we can't do that without the input of the administration. Um, but at least we're committing to have conversations with us together and, and take some decisions, ultimately, about what we mean by board governance. What do we mean? What do we really, what, is, what really is most important to us about, um, you know, what, that we want to see around student learning? Um, and, and how do we engage our communities? And figure that out in the next that's why they're kind of phrased that way, and I understand. I take your point really here that um, they, they lack specificity, um, but I think that's kind of the, the point, oh, point in a way. Yeah. But I'm really excited by this, what the School Quality Committee is doing. I was really blown away by that last meeting, um, excited by it. Um, so I think that this, that committee's already, in a way, farther down that path you know, than the rest of the, the boards are, um, because you've already been looking at this and asking these questions. So for whatever it's worth, I just want to explain kind of why they're, you know, why they're phrased the way they are. But yeah, we are having this meeting on the 30th, and there's certainly another round, at least one more round of revisions. And if people want to, you know, make changes or think they could be strengthened or be better or or um, have more specific things, or if you, as a board, you know, think that you can accept these, but you also want to have a fourth goal that that addresses something specific uh, to the building. You know, all that obviously is, is fine, so thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So I think one other piece that we, we had on our previous um, goals was policy work. And can I just say that I still highly suggest that the policy committee recent like every policy and start fresh from the recommended policies and then we can work from that point forward. The, the policy committee can't do that. But it's gotta be individual boards that voted in policies that would rescind. Right, policies. each board would have to rescind the policies. But it just gives us a starting point where we're, we're on a fresh slate. We're in a place where we can um, really address a big issue, I think, in a way that we're more likely to be on the same page. And by adopting the policies, the model policy, and if we really, like, if a board feels really out of it that they have to change the wording on something, then at least they have a starting point of, the policy exists, that's the policy they have, and they have something to work from. Because I, 
I still feel like some of the policies are just kind of out there in limbo. And it's going to be really tedious for somebody to go in and um, see when something was first read, second read, or adopted. And I think it would really address that one goal that was still kind of hanging out on our list. And I think it's still hanging out on the it's, list for a lot of yeah, schools. I, mean, I said to the policy committee when we met last week, I said, we've done the best we can. Here's the stack of policies. And it was tough for them to come to consensus about how to deal with them. And so we're going to start with something we tried four or five years ago, which took a lot of time, was to take a few policies at a time and go through them from the recommended. So I don't know when that. It took us, doing that procedure, took us four years to get through the required policies. Okay. Well, and it really is a two-pronged thing, even if it was, even if something like you're talking about here is done, which I don't really think you can. I mean, you need to have a policy ready to go in place before you can just get rid of stuff. But so even if you had your working set of policies, the other part of it is to make sure that online and anywhere that all the most current policies are there. So we're all working from the, the same spot. And that's, it's not there yet. Right. I, I guess in my mind what I was thinking is taking the recommended, or actually the required first, everybody would when I say everybody, I mean the board, all the boards would, do they still have to go through the first reading, second reading, and then adopt? According so to the policy. Meetings out? No, you don't have to. The policy on policy allows you to read it one night <laughs> and adopt it that night. that night. So I guess that would be, I guess in my mind, we would read the required and adopt them. Those would take, oh, like those would be the required. Those would go on the website, those would go in the handbook, but that's what we would build from. Well, we have those now, right, though? We, people have gone through all the requirements. We have them, but they are not all uniform. And they are not all the VSBA templates. Right. But, that have been vetted. It, but even so, out of the required that we have, whether or not they're all the same, if you go to our website, which is where I was pointed when I said, can I get policies? Those are not all the most current ones. And it's not just like from the last few months. I mean, there's one where our website has a 2004 version, but there's a 2015 version. So there, there's a couple of things going on. And I'm not sure how it stands at the other schools. I didn't look through everybody's website. I think that, yeah. I think my approach was so we could eliminate like, having that happen because everything would be at that point taken out of the website. All the new ones would go up. We know this date, all the policies were adopted. So we know this is the date that we started work to work from here forward. And the only reason I bring up that one policy is because it was, it's on, uh, under board governance, it's there, but it's still one that is kind of hanging out there. But there are different versions of different policies, which I, I'm not, you know, different issues can come up and people can find different policies they thought were the last ones adopted and they really were not. And it'd be, I don't know, I guess for me it would be one of those I would hope other school board could follow along to do the same thing for that fresh starting point. Just a thought. Okay. Yeah, no, I. Who, you're the policy rep right now. Did they have a meeting recently? Yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's some board. minutes. They're not approved minutes, but there were some minutes in here of the meeting we had. That's been the only meeting, as far as I know, for several months. In February, yes. Because it just seemed, ever since I was on the policy committee, it seemed crazy to me that we had so many versions and it took so long. 
it's an impossible situation when you want to be clear and you want to have a single policy and you want people to know what, what the rules are uh, for a particular situation. And I just thought, Bill, I mean, you sound as frustrated as, as any of us that you, you, you just don't know. I have a solution with the boards. I mean, my solution is very similar to yours, and it's that you do the boards that take care of this and keep their policies in good shape, they use the VSBA models yeah. because, and this is what my experience, there's no blame, don't take this as any blame. My experience is when board members have wanted to work with it, it really slows it down. Mm -hmm. So I understand the wanting to do it and uh, uh, it's just being able to come through it, come through with that. So it's either if we want to do it where, where we do a lot of reviews and input, the only way I can do more to have that be faster, and Krista expressed it uh, at the last policy meeting, we need to dedicate more staff time to it. Mm -hmm. So if that's something that boards want to do, it's going to come. We're going to have to take staff time away from something else. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a question that I'd like some, some to know the answer mm -hmm. to. The boards that do this quite, they usually do their policies in June, and they do them as a slate. And they say, here they are, and here are the VSB updates. Up they go, they do one reading. The boards, the district boards, our district? SU, or? not ours. No one in, no one in no Washington. One does that. You're saying boards that do it that way, so you, you would I be in favor that, of this. I'm in favor of what Vera is talking that's about. What I, I would highly recommend that the policy really consider, the policy committee really consider like opening their minds to something like this. Because I think it can be really helpful if you know, I was on the policy committee for many years, and it was just like the, the most tedious task ever. Can I just, the policy committee is an SU committee, right? Yes. So, so the, the policy committee does what the SU board instructs it to do. So it's not, I mean, the policy committee will we consider it if we tell my them to consider. When they were meeting, we would get in there and. So, just be overly I, so the, the reason I, I say it that way is because, again, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. No. I, 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 th I see it as part and parcel of that of that uh, board governance goal. Let's figure out like how we want to operate. And maybe I, one, I agree one with you. That. One component of how we operate could be that look, just we're going to simplify this entirely. Let's rescind. All, you know, previous policy, we'll follow the DSP model, and this is how we're going to do it. And we'll ask the policy committee to do A, B, and C. And there we, there we are. But I think the only way that's going to happen is if we are having that conversation again, all of us together. So, so would you be satisfied with that? Yeah, I think that's the best way to No, I would rather away. see it as as you why. Yeah. Each, obviously, each individual board is. I can definitely bring that feedback. Some chairs, maybe. That would be great. In the interest of time, I think we need to, to try to move through this board goals. Is there anything specifically that you would like to point out on behalf of Berlin or what you might like to see modified out of these executive committee goals? Um, one thing that Bill mentioned was what is our, do we have a different definition of community engagement? What does that mean to us? Some um, at that executive committee meeting we were talking about. For some people, that meant let's get people involved in the Act 46 discussion or um, just educated about Act 46. And for others, it was getting more people to volunteer at school um, or actually be in the school. Uh, are, there, are there any specifics there that you'd like me to contribute to the discussion? And I think what our homework at this point might be is to take those Berlin goals, that we, the old goals that we have developed, and see how well they fit under these broader goals. 
um, and perhaps whether we would want to see any of these broader goals modified to incorporate some of those things. Would everybody be okay with that approach, or would you still be in favor of very specific mm -hmm. building goals? I would like to get rid of the old goals, yeah. and I would like to support these goals and Good. maybe build off. Um, and again, it's just having those conversations, and I'm not saying we need to have them tonight. It's yeah. continuing the, the conversations about, um, and I'm not really sure how to write a few of my thoughts as a goal, but it's just literally having the conversations about increasing academic growth and success and um, you know, the, uh, maintaining deep and opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning and flexible pathways. Uh, providing support professional development for all staff. And then I had a few things underneath there. Um, it, and again, it's just having those conversations about you know, what each of us thinks is important and pursuing outcomes. And the biggest piece for me in the goal is the, um, the monitoring, which I think we're just, we're gonna learn as we go with how to monitor, what to monitor, who's monitoring, what. That's a piece for me. I, I just, I need to learn much more about what we're monitoring and how. But I think most of the boards are in the same place, would you say, Matthew, that board monitoring poll? Well, I, I think it's clear that it got prioritized. Yeah. Um, I'm glad because I think maybe similarly to community engagement, you, you get a few different answers if you, if you ask different people kind of what they mean by, by monitoring. So I think that's kind of where we're at. I think everybody has a feeling we need to get better at this. People may have different ideas about what that means. What, that means. what are your thoughts as far as the old goals? Oh, yeah, I'd like to start anew. The old goals were good for the time, and I think it, it framed some of the issues that were sitting right in front of us, and it framed the issues from a very clear perspective of the people who were sitting around this table. They were board member specific, and they were issue specific. Um, I, I like the thought of working together with the other boards and, and coming up, because we're all reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything, there are some things, but there aren't very many things in my view that are so Berlin specific that we can't wrap them into the, to the larger picture. I think one of the documents that can be looked at, not just is there anything that we wouldn't want to see fall off that was in the, the old board goals, yeah. but is the Act 46 survey. And that had a few things. You asked about community engagement, yeah. and that mentioned a few things as far as some people were saying, you know, this is the first that I've heard from the school in a long time, or what happened to having photos in the world. And just that type of thing where it, it's something where some of that maybe Berlin specific, like I think it was Chris Dodge that used to get photos into the paper on a really regular basis, but I think we could all benefit from what our, our communities collectively wishing for engagement. Um, and with that, when we were doing the, the principal interviews, um, talking about what our traditions are, and I think all of the schools have traditions, and some of those I think we kind of take for granted that they're happening, and maybe we don't do as good of a job communicating that out to people who would like to be involved with that in some way, and it's how can we make that happen? Where can we have that information for them to be aware that it is something that's still happening? So. Matthew, how do you see this one playing out in, under Goal 3, Community Engagement? It's, it's saying that the individual boards will have a discussion about the purpose um, of board level community engagement, and you draft a written, or the executive committee will draft a written purpose and strategy, and then the boards would approve that purpose and strategy. Can we, can we have those conversations? They would funnel up, they would filter in some way or prioritize or take the best ideas? Or how do you see that playing out? Yeah, I think the, I mean, in my opinion, the, the first step is is kind of giving everyone a common frame of reference and set of understandings about community engagement. So, you know, when we discussed the idea of having a board retreat in August, 
honest. I'm not, I'll just mention, by the way, you're from Vera and Corinne, which is fine. But I've been away. You've been away, okay. So, about having it, we should be on August 2nd, if, you're, if people are available. I'd like to get that here, I'm sorry. Um, no, it's no problem. Hmm. Um, but I, I think the, the main topic that's risen to the, the surface of needing some common training and discussion is, is community engagement specifically. So I think that would be kind of a first step. Um, but I also think I, I do hear the the district boards, you know, um, having a lot of different ideas about community engagement, um, and I respect that. So I want to, you know, yeah, I think each board needs to. I'd like to have that conversation together, and then each board can discuss maybe what it means to them, and then yes, we can reconvene and figure out by November if we if we have something in common. We can express and then pursue. Thank you. When was the time for the board to treat? August, of what time? It's all day. That's what we're looking at, yeah. Okay, so it would be all day. What all day means, I guess, is still. <laughs> yeah. so, so, we'd be done by like 435 o'clock? Oh, yeah, I don't think we'd. Yeah. We'll get the disco set up around 6. <laughs> so if we could put board goals on the next agenda, uh, again, we'll see where we are. Um, but give it some thought in, in, in terms of putting it within the broader framework and the specific Berlin actions and goals you'd like to, to see incorporated in some way. All right, so let's move on. Um, we can go quickly through uh, construction. The capital list with the dollar figures is, is still there. At some point, I think we should try to prioritize this, this uh, capital project list. There's still a few gaps there for filling in dollar figures, which is on my plate, and I apologize for not having anything in there yet. Um, but just keep that one in mind as far as prioritizing what comes next. Is there any update to the what's happening with the roof? Yes, the roof will start uh, probably the day after the kids leave. So they were ready to start actually a couple days earlier and had the rest of the snow We just wait till the kids are done. And I haven't heard anything back saying we couldn't, so I'm assuming we're positive in that. Carol, do you have any pothole reports for us? Well, they're working on them. We're putting in the fill, and I know Eric had said that he had something uh, that he thought might work better, and then he found out it's what we've already tried. So um, now that the weather's better and he can, he did some work out there. So, yeah, so it's going to be ongoing. Was I? Thinking that the sinkhole repair is it should be off the list. Right? It should be off the list. It should be off the list. It was done. That's why I was assuming a few of those didn't have any extra because we actually had a discussion about I think, some shades too that were that is done. Yeah. So I need to do some work on this list. Strike some of those. There. I can. Because we seem to have the same conversation about. This. Yes. <laughs> Let's not do that again. So I'll I'll uh, I'll try to update that for our next meeting. And if there was um, oh, another thing is yep. we are getting the cubbies for the kindergarten, oh, yeah. so we can take that off the list. Okay. At some point, I'd like to add to that the um, where the old ball field used to be, where the sinkhole repair has been. I don't know if that's on a list anywhere, Carol. But as far as making that like a playable field again. There's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some ups and downs with the equipment was in there. I think it would be really great to have kind of a second space for baseball. Mm -hmm. I believe practice that season. the gentleman that um, had that ball field originally put in in honor of his son had just come in and we talked uh, with Lori and discussed that he had also pledged to upkeep and so that is, I think, in the works. Oh, he might work on that. That's great. Yes. Okay. Uh, so hopefully we'll have some more information on that next time around and we can start prioritizing. Um, next on the agenda, 3.5 board member appointment. I did get an email from Peter Schober. Um, his email of interest is in the packet where he, he Peter was not able to be here tonight. He had a, a previous appointment, so he couldn't come tonight, but we wanted to. Um, but he asked this correspondence to be his statement of willingness to accept a temporary appointment to fill out a vacant and expired term at the Berlin Elementary School Board of Directors. I have served on the Berlin 
U32 and WCS SCU boards previously and recognize the importance of having a full board. Thank you for your consideration, Peter Schober. I don't know if anyone here um, knows Peter, but uh, certainly his previous experience would be welcome on the board. And we have an item below to appoint a board member should everyone decide we should appoint Peter Schober. I definitely attended meetings in the past when Peter was on the board, and uh, I would be willing to make a motion to okay. appoint him to fill out the term. Great. Let's do that under um, under the action agenda. Mm -hmm. and I guess any other general discussion about potential board member? Okay. 3.6, the annual financial management questionnaire. And that's on page 10 for a packet. Yes, this is something you've seen the past three years that's required by the state auditor. Um, Lori fills this out, and by our auditors look to see that there was a discussion by the board, you don't need to approve it. And then Chris would sign off at the bottom that the discussion was held um, as the board chair. Um, and Nothing has changed from last year to this year with this questionnaire. We haven't had any findings or anything that our auditors said that needs to be changed either at this addresses or. Thank you. Any questions? And this is specifically for central office or is it specifically for Berlin? It's specifically for Berlin. And then. Um, this, most of this work, not all this work, but most of this work happens up at Central Office on Berlin School District's behalf. And Lori's in charge of it. Lori Bebo. Not Thank you. Yeah, not Lori. Lori Dutton does the supporting pieces here that you can get here on site. Yeah. Thank you. item, uh, principal visit in June, item 3.7, which is something that, that um, I suggested maybe when Aaron is next coming to Berlin, he is, that um, we could arrange, something I saw was coffee with the new principals that Williamstown was doing, and I thought it might be a, a nice thing or a nice opportunity to introduce him to the community and want some of the parents who didn't get to, or community members who didn't get to meet him say hello and, and see what he's all about while he's here. And Carol mentioned that he was coming to visit with her in June, and we might be able to, to arrange that. It's, it would be an after-school thing, right? He's coming in the afternoon. Well, actually, I think Bill has talked to him further, and he's going to be here, and he's going to join the admin team meeting, and then he'll be coming over, or we'll be coming over directly after that. And like I said, I'm arranging some meetings with him for some key people in the school, and then it could be at the end of the day. He said he's, he'd love for that to happen. So when is this? Yeah, did you have a date for that? Yes, it was June 5th. June 5th? It's a Tuesday. And you think we could arrange an after-school kind of thing, come by and meet? And I think that would school? be lovely, yes. I think that would be very, very nice. Anybody have any thoughts, ideas about that? Just make it idea. And get the word out. I can do um, a front porch forum, and maybe some, Carol can, we can do something for the, the newsletter or the Blackboard Connect. Cool. Just to put it out there, Stephen does it also at U32, the first, second Thursday. Yeah. Oh, he does it monthly? Yeah. And I have very much taken advantage of going during this time. It'd be nice to actually maybe think about hosting those like, twice a year or something. More rain. Yeah. yeah. In the conversation. Okay. If everybody's okay with that, we'll move along. I'll be in touch on that, Carol. Okay. Thank you. 
4.0 reports to the board. 4.1 administration. I think one of the things that I really wanted to um, discuss, if you want to open it up, is just looking at our configurations for next year. And that um, if you have any other questions concerning the rest of the reports, I'd be glad to address it. But I think that one is an issue. Is a, is a key area that we should look at. Presently, we have 11 kindergartners enrolled. Um, I have brought this possible issue up to Bill about two months ago, Bill? Yeah, at and, least. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he, um, he uh, gave a, an incredible advice and was helping us through but he said go out and beat the bushes i want you to really beat the bushes to make sure so Lori and i talked we started looking for all the daycares uh, preschool programs we know a lot of the preschool programs because of the act 160 now mm -hmm. but we sent out letters we sent out flyers uh, what we had in the paper asking them to share with them with berlin parents we had the open enrollment time we put it out even afterwards and we still are at 11 students we have one parent who is visiting on friday to make a determination again because of act 160 we have a better grasp of who we have out there because we are supporting them in the past it, it and it's been brought to my attention several times that in the past we've had to hire someone in the last minutes of August because all of a sudden these students appeared. Um, I, I, I don't see that happening now the, because we do have that at 160. We do have the idea of who's here and also we have this extremely strong preschool program here at our school that is really getting accolades around. We have a waiting list for our preschool right now. Um, because of the connection between community connections and our preschool and our excellent teachers in both programs have good, really good reputations. Um, that being said, I think at a certain point we are going to have to make a determination to move forward and at this point my recommendation will be to move forward three, three, fours and one kindergarten and two, one, two. Um, that uh, is something that I will talk very specifically with Aaron about. I have brought it to Bill's attention extensively so that he can pick up with Aaron over the summer. I'm more than happy, I'm not going to work in the summer, so I'm more than happy to come in and help out any way I can. But uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's going to be a tough decision, but I think it's the route we're going to go at this point in the year. So, I mean, our, this our, being... Yeah, our, our conversation, Carol and I had this conversation, our break point is probably 21 for kindergarten. And we think about going to, that's a very large kindergarten, and that may mean some other hands, but at the same time, of how to distribute the student load across the system and meet up every student's needs. Um, we don't like kindergartens that are bigger than uh, 18, and that's the recommendation. Uh, that's a Vermont school quality recommendation, but um, you know we just don't know. And I think Carol, I know Carol has done done a great job with canvassing as many people as she can. And um, in the past two years, two other schools have had to reconfigure two weeks before school starts. So we just wanted to alert you. We are doing. Carol is doing the best with her team here to figure out what the number is for kindergarten, but we may not know until a week or two before school starts. And we're, she's being very transparent, both with the new hires and with strategic that way, with one of our new hires that you already approved, that knowing that they have experience in three, four, and in the primary grades, uh, but also, <coughs> you know, transparent with all the teachers in the, in the building as well. Mm -hmm. And how many, what's full in preschool? Preschool, we're actually over enrolled. We have six on the waiting list, unless that's changed since last week. Has I heard? believe it's at seven now. It's at seven. Um, we're investigating a couple other ways. Um, I am trying to, I have it yet, just uh, my task list to do, but I have a conversation with Head Start 
uh, and Capstone to see if there's a possibility of partnering with them to bring in a third classroom into the building. But how, so how many is full? What's what's capacity so for a preschool? We're allowed to have um, up to 15 students with two adults in the room. So that's a paraeducator and a teacher. And so really to make that third classroom, we need to get to 10 students to make it um, to make it kind of be cost neutral with what we receive um, in ADM. So we're losing like 15 or 16 or 17 or something kids because the numbers I'm seeing here is 175 K through six. And if you add on 15 preschoolers, that's 190. 15 in the morning and 15 in the afternoon. Ah, okay. So then we're still over 200. Yes. So 205, we'll, we'll, but that's yeah, still down. And it'll still, it's not going to be Yeah, I, I can't even tell you that that's even a projection. Right. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's variable. I mean, as Corinne asked Carol earlier, what's been the transit rate? This year it's been pretty small, low, but Berlin, in the history that I've been here, it's been rather high. Yeah. It's around. 40 to 50 percent of kids who won school year, so that includes the summer. Um, we've seen that type of rate of turnover. So you've heard the board in the past kind of push back on too many multi-age classes, but this gives you, the, I would imagine, the greatest amount of flexibility should a handful of new students arrive on day one where you're not pushing a particular fifth grade teacher right. over into an impossible right. situation and then you have the reconfiguring that you, you in those first couple of weeks that we didn't go well. I mean, didn't say didn't go well. It wasn't ideal. Right. We didn't want to do right. a couple of years. I think that gives you flexibility for that. I would want to say that Carol's worked with the staff here really well to, while this is the classroom, the, the, the starting out in the morning, Instructionally, does instruction does happen? Different, they're able to differentiate more flexibly for students, yeah. and be able to say, "Hey, we can move groups of students to meet their needs better," yeah. as well as look for single grade instruction. So while you might see a one-two, I know for math is not being taught one-two; it's being taught straight grades. Yeah. So the kids move around. And the schedule that we're looking at right now is also utilizing the. 40% of the math interventionist and the one reading interventionist to help with those multi-grades as well to make sure that we are doing some uh, grade alike uh, looking at um, more looking at student need actually than just grade so that that's uh, very important as well um, the teachers love it because they are to team together and work together and look at the data together and plan together and that is really important for them as well. That is very helpful. It's, it, to do it with a team compared to do it in isolation is, is night and day. So I know you had some, some, I had some feedback, I'm sure you did as well, from parents who were concerned that their child was either not in a multi-age group or was in a multi-age and how do you make the distinction and why does this child go here and this child go here? If you have three one twos and three three fours, does that help make that go away because everybody's in a multi -age? I'm going to move so this person is <laughs> going back and forth. <laughs> um, yes, I have to say that also helps as well. Some people feel because their child is in the one two in their first grade or that they're going to get the advantage of thank you of being you know getting some second grade curriculum at the first grade so some people who are in the fir first grade only want their child in the one two then if there are uh, second graders in the one two they don't feel like their parent is saying well my child's going to be getting the first grade if you have those three one twos and the teachers have the ability through infinite campus and looking at the assessments that we have in place, working with the interventionists, they can set up where they move. I and mean, kids go into different classrooms and they're working at the level that they need so that they can have, like if they're having a guided reading group, 
um, just because they happened to be in the homeroom with uh, Kay McHugh. Uh, our new Ke Kelly, who is coming up, might be able to better meet the needs. She'll move them into a group, and she'll take a higher level. Of, you know that that, and it, it they they have the time in their schedule to plan that and work on that, and get that um, those groupings going and moving the kids out. And I've sat in on some of the meetings um, where they'll be talking about. You know, I think. Um, little Bobby is ready to move out of my group, I think that that child should join this group because they're advancing so well, um, I think. Or this group is moving on and little Bobby isn't doing as well. Um, let's see with a little intervention what might help, but they might do better in that other group to, that's focusing on the skill that they need. So to be able to meet that, that's true MTSS, what we were just talking about. A multi-tiered, you know, systems of support. Does anybody have questions about the potential configurations here or anything else in Carol's report? No question. Just a comment. No. I'm definitely more of a proponent of K for two being single grade, but I think this is the best best fit for the numbers we have. With the recommendation from you, Carol, with keeping this um, multi-age at basically all levels. And I think um, when configuring the classrooms with kids and, and the teachers, you, uh, you have so much more flexibility on what you guys can do mm -hmm. with each classroom by doing it this way rather than one, one, two, split, a straight first and a straight mm -hmm. second. Because then I do think there's that perception of disparities if you do the three different classrooms like that. So I support this. Thank you. I think it's a great way to select that perception to think of things to do. And what are your upper limits again for your ideals for number of students in the classroom for one, two, three, three, fours? So K, K through two, it's 18. And then from three to six in Vermont, it's 24. The international research is a little higher than that, but that goes against. But we, we pushed it. So it was nice. These numbers. The only thing I'll ask, I didn't write a report for the, all the boards in April, but um, we've given you a color-coded calendar. We still need to give you negotiations. Uh, if you have a black and white version, hopefully your electronic one is at home, so you can use that. It's hard to use when it's black and white. We still need to fill negotiations on here and some school start time after June. So we do not have a school start time right, right now? Right. Because it was, it was Carl. Carl. It was Carl. Yeah. I'm so. not has anybody, have you been going to that? Have you cool. I went to the first couple. I was available. Um, what I had noticed on this calendar was that I would still advocate for us to still, us meaning the Berlin Board, to have a meeting in the months even when there's a WCSU meeting. I think in order to really feel like we're moving ahead in dealing with the goals and other things that we have. Not knowing for sure what's going to happen with Act 46 or anything, but to make sure that, that we have the time to have the conversations we need. And they don't have to be long meetings, but just to keep that. And to me, that's part of public engagement, too, is just having a time that people can, can count on. Just trying to see that's still on our, we've been putting that on our future agenda items for a while, right? To have that conversation. Yeah, well, and we were kind decision. of waiting for for this, I think, as far as um, how, if, what the minimum would be for the, for the number of uh, WCSU meetings. Yeah. 
Can you go down to the mm -hmm. Not that I want to meet on the first Monday because that's Labor Day and I really don't so want to have a meeting on the holiday. Right. Right. Whatever the we're second. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. If I could ask, um, are you? Do I understand you? You're suggesting that the billing board would meet every month or every every time that there's a carousel. Okay. So that um, and and sometimes with it being, I mean, during budget time, we need to have or at least we have had. Um, try to have more public outreach and all we to give do. people the opportunity to come in. And so yeah. I, it, there's also been a few times where we've had staff come and present. And I felt really bad when it's ended up being at U32 because it's not only further out of the area, but it's a much later meeting. You know, So these meetings in the WCSU one start at 530. But if we have a meeting after that, then it's 7 or so that anybody is joining us to so, so can I just offer a couple of comments? To, um, Go ahead. So the, the, the suggestion or the idea and the commitment to go to the, using the carousel meetings really came with two primary um, purposes. One, one was kind of uh, to take a step in the direction of um, addressing what I, what I sort of referred to earlier about this, this issue that we, we really find it very challenging to work together as boards. Um, so if there were any way possible that we could get, we could gather together as boards and address in one sitting, as it were, um, issues or priorities or decisions that, um, you know, impact on us all in common, uh, that carousel meetings would really be a way for us to do that throughout the year. Um, we also featured the carousel meeting in our, in our um, AGS proposal as a specific example of how the SU boards had, had taken a step towards in the direction of working together more efficiently and, and as a group. Um, so I'd just point out that we really sort of hung our hats on that in a way. As I'm not a, saying to get rid of it. No, 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 I, I understand you. I'm just saying, like, uh, the, the second priority of the CARES on meetings is, is for the sake of the administrators who, you know, for better or worse, are, you know, re really have to be at these meetings. Um, so if there's any way that we can, you know, kind of reduce um, the burden on them, um, you know, that also is sort of a part of the, uh, the care summit concept as well. So I just offer that up as comment, like, you know, do it the way you go, but I just want to yeah. appreciate those comments, Matthew. I just want to make a comment that in my time here, I believe we've lost three or four board members because of the amount of time spent on meetings and not just here with negotiations and mm -hmm the other meetings that individuals have to be involved in so that they, they volunteer for these meetings, but then they don't realize that they have to volunteer for so many other times out. So I'm just putting that out as a, a thought. It, it, it appears to me we lost several school board members due to that time commitment. I just... Those are all appropriate things to consider if you want to thoughts, Corinne? I, I, I don't think there's a perfect solution, but as I said, if, if we want, we've also, in having the turnover, there's more to, I think, need to discuss and get on the, the same page about. Yeah. And you can't do that if you're not meeting. I mean, and I've said everything else as far as it ends up being a 7 o'clock meeting, and if you want to have somebody present something, it's either pushing it off or it's asking them to, to be out late. It's asking people to, to leave what could be perceived as their comfort zone coming to the local school as opposed to going up to a school that they may not be familiar with. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we kind of take it as a, just in stride as far as, you know, the meeting's going to be in room 128. It's going to be in 120. It's going to be wherever, and there's no problem going up and, and navigating that. But I think in order to encourage people to feel comfortable with coming, having it locally is is good. No, I don't. I don't disagree with any of that. Although I just I haven't seen people coming to the meetings here either, so it's hard hard to justify it based on on that in my mind. 
Um, I also just want to make sure that we actually have work that we need to and we get, are we running out of time to get our work done so that we would necessitate another meeting? I don't want to fill, just kind of fill time to say that we're, we're getting together, but we do have a lot of work on our plates that we could be, could be working on. I think board, having board some, and things like that. some of the presentations that we've had, I think, have been really mm -hmm. awesome. I mean, to hear about the farm to school, to hear about Genius yep. Hour, there's, there's been a lot of you know, good stuff, and I, I'd love to see some of that continue. Not that we need to repeat the same stuff every yeah. year, but to just make sure that we have time in our schedule to, to have that. Okay. Any other discussion? We were on. I guess that was your report, Bill. Was yes, I did. The calendar. Yep. the uh, finance report finance report um, you've had a little more interest in uh, miscellaneous income this month I'm on page 16 sorry um, and we've had the need for additional student support so you'll see down the expense change there's a behavior interventionist there for a student besides that you're staying um, even with that change, we're still yeah, you're still doing well. Yeah. You're still doing well. You know, I, I think we're going to be asking you in June to move some money over to the more money over to the capital yeah, fund. Okay. And, you know, having that priorities and talking about how we might be able to contract some things out. The one I would put up there is painting because it's, as you know, Chris, is very labor intensive. It's not the painting, it's the scraping and prepping. And to ask our custodial staff to do that. <laughs> which we all experience but everything else is doing well um, you know we'll tie up after the roof is done the total of where we are with the bond and all that okay we'll you can think in the positive that they're just natural speed bumps you could think about that that'd be a good way of putting it I like that <laughs> Bill how long is it projected that the roof will take uh, I believe it's five or s I think it's five weeks but I'm not exactly sure Corinne I'd have to check with John and Bill Ford. Will it be a concern that we're having summer school here? No. Okay. Because they're going to get it done. Okay. All right. Is that it, Bill? That's it on the finance. 4.3 Executive Committee. You've heard a lot about what the Executive Committee was up to at, uh, at our last meeting with the, the board goals that you've seen here. Um, Matthew mentioned the retreat. As a, as a possibility, hopeful that can can pull that together. Um, that's basically it from the last meeting. Add anything else? The only other thing is the topic that came up about hiring and about uh, you know kind of if, if we stand to lose candidates potentially, um, especially in the spring. And I, I just got so uh, just the what came up was. Uh, that some of the hiring gets done at the SU level for special ed particularly. So there were three or four candidates who came up at the same time, you know, that we were in danger of losing because we didn't have any board meeting scheduled for weeks out. Um, but, but, you know, Bill needed authorization to kind of act with regard to extending offers and hiring. And then it happened again not that long after that. So we just had a conversation about, you know, to what extent we, the boards need to be involved in what, what typically is a fairly um, kind of rubber stamp type process where you know, we get the documentation and um, anyway, I just noting that we had that conversation we didn't resolve anything or you know, get anywhere Thank you. Thank you. Policy committee. Anything to report there? I think um, it kind of got touched upon earlier that um, we're supposed to go ahead with the recommended policies four or five at a time and work through them. That Krista had just recently sent a bunch of approved required ones 
to the various people at the schools and the policy committee asked to have those sent to them also to have the, the final version of it. We didn't really come up with an outcome though as far as how to make sure the websites are updated, although we did talk about how once we have more that are policies that are in common, they could probably be stored at one location and pointed to them rather than to have you know, Berlin's policies and other people's policies. It would just be a page of policies. We have the school quality committee. Um, Bill and, and you, no one was there from Berlin. For yeah, that one. Beer yeah. was there. Oh, Beer was there. Yeah. She's your rep. I was there. School, one things we're going to. Sorry, I'm talking. I'm thinking school started. So just as that, Beer's there. Just as that started. I love one of the things that my, that came my, from. Um, sorry, Beer. I'm just going to say one of the things that um, Susanna Culver asked last week as the board chair prep. She said, "Can you put the parentheses of each board member?" by each committee so they know they're ready to re report when I'm doing my meeting. I said, that sounds like a great idea. I might, that is great I might idea. put that everywhere. Excellent. That is a really good idea. Um, the minutes are in here. I yeah. love serving on this committee. It's like where my passion and my heart is. Um, I think it's a great group of people that were asking good questions and I'm looking forward. I mean, I've only been to the first meeting. But um, just diving into like what is the data telling us, and back to the monitoring piece and the teaching. Uh, and I'm looking forward to what the next meeting is. Do you guys have any questions on? Uh, well, I guess one question I might have is, so do you see, can you see the school quality committee you know, picking up that work under the uh, board goal number two or whatever it was from the executive committee of, of monitoring? I would say yes, but I'm not sure. I think it can. I mean, I think it really can. It's. Uh, I would definitely say that was Yeah. I think part, very much part of the conversation. All right. I, I, I'll just say Kari, Kari who's the chair of that mm -hmm. committee, uh, had a huge hand in shaping the way goal two is, is laid out. So, okay. sorry. Okay. All right, on to 5.0, the action agenda. 5.1 is approved non-bargaining contracts. So every time this year there, um, we talk about non-bargaining contracts, and that usually includes the principal, but you've hired Aaron and set his contract. So really, we're here to talk about the custodians and uh, the one administrative assistant that works uh, that's non-bargaining. And so the ESP, what you've negotiated for ESP is a 3.5% raise for next year. And my recommendation is that you do the same for them. Um, many of them, all four of those positions have three of the four positions, I should say, have counterparts that are in the association in other schools or in this school. And one of those positions, uh, Chuck Paquette, is supervising folks. And that's been the recommendation if you're supervising the SP folks that you get the same. OK. Questions for Bill? So you just need a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation with respect to non-bargaining contracts? That's what I need, yeah. On the motion. A second. All right, any further discussion? Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And 5.2, accept a resignation. You have it on page 27 of your packet. And that's from Shafa Austin. I've had people reach out to me, and it sounds like Garrett has too, saying, is there any way we can keep him here? He's done such a wonderful, wonderful job as, a, as the chef here. What is Fresh Picks Cafe that he's going to? I've never heard of it. I'm not sure. Something in New Hampshire that he's working on. Uh, 
So, Bill, could you maybe tell us about the, the, the contract for food service? So food service is set in your ESP contract that you have with the association. So we have a salary scale that sets what um, the salary, is, the, the hourly wage rate is set at based on experience. Um, and there is no wiggle room in that. And what I can tell you, I don't want to give too much, I want to keep, try to respect Austin's privacy. Um, even if you were at the top of the pay scale, he wouldn't get to where he's been offered in the private industry. And it is one of the problems we have. Are there any other creative ways of supplementing salary if we have a really I would wonderful be, I would be going outside the negotiated agreement and then we'd have a grievance. We tried to pull it up by having him be in charge of the healthy snacks and giving that more time, but it's still, as Bill said, I presented it to Bill and we have discussed it and he knows the figures. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying in this particular instance, but for the future, if we can't keep a really great person like that around, are there any other options that we can explore? You are, when you, when the, um, when the employees chose to form the ESPU organization, the job classifications came in. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to, you could try to bargain to take those out. That would be a very hard task to do. And that's the only way that you can do this. So this question is not specific to the situation. It's a very general question. So if, again, you had that employee that you wanted to keep, is it in the negotiation, the contract, that you can't receive monies, whether it be a stipend for another program or for their time and with anything else? It has you to had, be very specific to that It has to stay to within the job. rate at which they are required for the job that they're doing if it's called for, if it's covered by the negotiated agreement. I mean, I agree it's wonderful when he posts the lunch menu and we have students that are doing extra chores to buy so that they can yeah, get I, his food. Yeah, I don't want to it's, lose him either. I mean, it's just, it's... He is a wonderful, wonderful person. I wish I had a way to... These, there are sometimes that different frustrations come out at different times. That's probably the best way to say it. All right, so I guess with regret, uh, I would entertain a motion to accept the resignation of Austin Jacobs. I would just add, with regret and gratitude for everything he's done, whether it be for the staff program or junior iron chef, which was all volunteered on its own time. Is that a motion? Yep, it was. <laughs> Is there a second? Yep. And those in favor say aye. 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 5.3 is a point of board member. You saw or heard me read the email from <coughs> Peter Schober. I would entertain a motion at this time to uh, appoint Peter Schober as a board member to fill the vacancy until the next election. So moved. Is there a second? Yes. Was there any further discussion on that one? Okay. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And we have appointed Steve Schober as board member. And we thank him for that. And I'll be in touch with him to let him know when the next meeting is. And I'm sworn in. Right. Go see Corinne. Go see Corinne yep. for the swearing. Yep. Yes. Uh, 5.4 is appoint a board member to the WCSU School Start Time Committee. Um, we lost when, when Carl resigned. Do you have any volunteers? Look, I'm already doing negotiations and school quality, so I know I can. Should we see if Peter would be interested? We could. Mm -hmm. I think that's he needs a new assignment. He needs a new assignment. <laughs> I, I think that's what we should number. start with. That's a good idea, Corinne. 
I can is that know. the only one that Carl was on? Yes, yes. it was, okay. which is why I say I think it's I only fair to, to I see just if you do. table is still Jim. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. We'll table to Jim. And I'll shoot him an email to see if he's interested. Uh, 6.0 approved board orders. Did everybody get to see and sign? Oh, they did, correct. I'll take it. Give Corinne a minute to take a look at those. And if you're okay with it, Corinne, I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. You want to open it up for discussion after sure. that? Yep. Yeah. So I really appreciate that Lori sends them out mm -hmm. beforehand. It's super helpful. And I just had a question that there's still the um, Bulldog storage on um, the border. Yeah, so I talked to Carol about that today because okay. there's still a bulldog container out there. Okay. <laughs> I thought they were all gone. Uh, they're not all gone. They're not all gone. Yeah, there's one right by the guard. Oh. It'll be gone, if not at the end of this week, the following week. That's fine. Other than that, I do appreciate Lori sending them out. Before. Yeah. Sure. has made the motion to approve the board orders. $1,650.04. Is there a second? Yep. And all of the favor signify by saying aye. 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 And we've approved the board orders. Um, future agenda items. Uh, we have that local meetings versus supervisory meetings. And maybe we can make a decision on whether we want to do that at our, at our next meeting. Uh, we had school safety has been on there. Oh, did, Carol, did we talk about that? Perhaps talking about what, what's been happening I with school safety. I think that's on there for something coming from the WCSU from the committee, the school safety. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think Jen, did she see June? We are looking at that. It's something we've been looking at. Uh, it's being. I would just leave it on there. Okay. It's not anything. And I think we'll leave. Um, we'll put board goals on again for another discussion. Can we, like, really either adopt board goals in June or like narrow down what we're going to do so it's not carried out? Sure. To September or October. Do we expect some, expect something? What's the timing of our board chairs meeting and maybe our modification of board goals? That's on May 30th, and the idea is to have the, the draft goals finalized for adoption on the 6th. Yeah, that's the plan. Okay, good. Here's the important the timeline. There you go. Um, was there anything else that anyone wanted to add to future agenda items? Is some of these, no, no, and nothing to add. What's there, I know you'll get some of that. Carol, we took off the walkthroughs this time because it's the length of the meeting. That's right. So she'll do that in June. Walkthroughs. I'll just give you the coming attraction as Carol is, she's in classrooms a lot, giving a lot of feedback to everybody. So. Okay. Good. Am I recalling that perhaps the June 6th meeting is actually 5.30 to 7.30 instead of 7? For the supervisory union board, I don't recall right this minute current. Is 5.30 different start time or not? No, we've been no. starting at 5.30 That's what I for thought. the year. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes they end at 7, but uh, I don't think we've talked about it. Yeah. As long as I start time, time, I just want to make sure I'm there on time. Is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. Adjourn at 7.30. Excellent. Thank you.
Thanks, everybody.